Today we celebrate this feast of St. James and St. Philip. Uh, scripture scholars will say they're not too certain, or absolutely certain, which James this is. Because in Matthew's Gospel, James Alpheus is one name, and then James, the brother of the Lord, is another name. And most scholars think that these two are the same person, as distinguished from James the Greater, who would be the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, he'd be called James the Greater. This would be James the Less. I don't like that so much, that title, James the Less. It's like I told you before, it's like Gladys Knight and the Pips. You know, we're always in the Pips. You know, Gladys gets all the headline. James the Less, though, is the son, they believe, of the sister of Mary, the son of Clovis. And uh, he was obviously a relative cousin to Jesus, and after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he became a prominent member of the Jewish community in Jerusalem itself. Uh, in fact, he was the leader of it. And he was so esteemed that he incurred the, the wrath and the resentment and the jealousy of the high priest of that year, Adonis, so much so that he provoked the Sanhedrin to have another trial, much like Jesus falsely condemned, and he was then uh, thrown from the parapet of the temple when he hit the ground off some badly injured, and then he was clubbed to death uh, and killed. All because they were afraid of him and afraid of the truth. What, who, what he was doing and the power he had, he was so influential in the community there in Jerusalem. Philip, on the other hand, was another possible. We know that uh, He's the one that's uh, the early disciple of John the Baptist. Uh, he was the one that introduced uh, Nathaniel to Jesus, obviously from the area of uh, Bethsaida. Uh, his name is a Greek name, so he probably, as most of the people in that area, did speak Greek. In fact, Jesus possibly spoke Greek as well, because that was a caravan uh, trail right there, and it go right through Galilee. So they probably spoke several different languages. But certainly, Philip probably spoke Greek. And he was one, as I said, in his Nathaniel to Jesus. He was the one that, uh, when they, he was at the uh, multiplication of loaves and fishes, when Jesus, Jesus said, well, these people are hungry, we've got to feed them. And it was Philip said, well, we've got to get 200 days wages, we're going to feed all these people. Uh, and then it was Andrew who brought forward the little boy. It was Philip, as we heard in the Gospel today, who was at the Last Supper, and when he said those beautiful words, uh, Show us the Father, it'll be enough for us. Oh, Philip, there have been with you so long, you do not know that uh, you see me, you see the Father. The Father's living you. And uh, that became a conviction for Philip that he would go on and be martyred uh, for the faith. All because he preached Jesus. It's amazing. Uh, the, the, the world suffers nothing from our proclamation of the truth. As Tertullian would say, it suffers nothing from it, but it hates us and pours out its worst torments on us for saying the truth. Because we choose not to enjoy the world's pleasures, it hates the truth. And that's the point, brothers and sisters. Nothing much has changed. We are called to be preachers and proclaimers and witnesses to Jesus Christ. You notice in this passage we had today, something unique. What Jesus is saying. He's saying he's truly the son of the living God. He's truly God in human nature. He's not just a nice teacher. He's not a truth. He is truth itself. He is not, as Buddha said, a way. He is the way to life. He's not just a life, like a famous person, like Abraham Lincoln, a wonderful character. He's not just a life, a historical character. He is life itself, truth itself, love itself, mercy itself. Forgiveness itself. He is God in human nature. Believe that. And not only believe it, but maybe become a witness to it because we're facing the world as antagonistic, probably even more antagonistic than the world uh, that Jesus and the apostles faced. I say that because we are uh, in a mass social networking world, so untruth and hatred can be spurred up so quickly. Uh, if there was troubles, they were usually kind of isolated areas that didn't spread over there too much. Now it's immediate communication. And if you want to spread a falsehood, if you 
wish you that it's so easy to do today. And so the perniciousness and the pervasiveness of the evil uh, is, is very frightening. Now I say that because of two things that I read recently. Today in uh, newadvent.org, there is a replica of or a, re a reprinting of George Will's call about John, the son. Very interesting that he wrote an article much like this about 30 years ago when John was only five years old. And John is a Down syndrome boy and now a man, 40 years old. And 25 years ago, George Will uh, had said, 30 years ago, that uh, when he got and received this child, at first they were stunned and confused. And yet, as life has gone on, he's become what a blessing. And he was using to say, though, uh, the opinion of the doctors, and he repeated it today in this article, automatically said uh, to him and his wife, well, you're going to leave the baby here, aren't you? We'll just basically dispose of it in the warehouse, in the institution, or maybe adopt it of some kind for me. You're certainly not taking this child home. Because this would be such a burden across. Boy, have I heard that from many parents who have Down syndrome. Oh, you should have had an ambulance of pieces and just killed the child. Had an abortion. Be done with it. It's too much of a cross. And yet those parents have told me after 25, 30 years that they had one child who was Down syndrome and four other children. And whoever, all the people thought this child was a monster because he looked different with blank, bleak features. And oh, you had these such beautiful children. They said, the irony is the four children became the monsters. Self-centered, self-absorbed, narcissistic, very intimidating. And this one has become the treasure of their life. Caring, kind, gentle. They have a sense of entitlement, just a life of gratitude, an appreciation of the small, beautiful things of life, about family, about love, and about sharing. I've heard that many times. And George Will was saying the tragedy is where our country is going, about 90% maybe a little bit more of Down syndrome children diagnosed by MDCs that are just now aborted. And he said the tragedy is that my son was such a gift of mine. He said he's now managed, they said he wouldn't go very far, but he's managed now the metro system of Washington, and he managed to know how to go right down to the Washington Senator's uh, uh, stadium and how to get to it, and how the, the team, these very privileged, entitled athletes, given great have, have treated him so kindly. He cleans up their locker room, he sits behind the dugout, and he boos for the opposite team, and he cheers for his team, and he says, and he has such a I contrast that with another article in New Edmund.org today about a review of Dr. Phil's uh, program where a woman who had in a field for her severely handicapped children, but she was proposing to pass a law that mothers be allowed to terminate the lives of severely handicapped children after birth. That itself is chilling. But more chilling is when Dr. Phil asks the opinion of the audience, 90% of the people agree with her. Mm. Brother and sister, if you have to understand what's happening, this is the fallout of the baby boomers generation. When we threw God out, we went our own way, we went the way of our own feelings and the way of our own desires, and, and we're reaping now, we sowed in this wind, and now we're weeping a male storm, a tornado, of evil that has convinced people that people only have value if they're beautiful, if they're smart, if they're talented, and uh, if they have the right idea that life owes them everything, they don't have to work, they're entitled to it. And anything that might interfere with their comfort level, you can get rid of it simply by killing it. This is what we're facing. This is why it's important we come around to these great feasts of these apostles. Think of their courage. Think of their indefatigable efforts to preach the gospel and their, their unwavering hope, even though they faced the world, it was probably felt like they were coughing against thunder. And yet they still coughed and they still shouted against that, that onslaught. And, brothers and sisters, it didn't look like they would win. In fact, people said they was going to be dead. But for every one that went down, another ten were born. And they succeeded in converting the Roman Empire.
as you know, history has been a recycle, constant addressing of the evil that grows back like weeds. You pick them out and then they come back. But we have it here before us. And I find it as a, a challenge time to brothers and sisters who are lucky to get this time. Maybe we'll get to be martyrs. Maybe. What we need to do, though, is to prepare for that. Uh, by praying to be faithful in our own ways and never giving up on the fight of evil, starting here in our own hearts. You don't have to go too far. Just start with your own heart. Start confronting those kind of sinful habits, that those, those sins. If you've got one of the big weeds, go after the little ones because they get big. Go after them and keep attacking them. And when you get a chance, don't be afraid to stand up and say, no, I don't agree with that. What? You don't agree with abortion? No, I don't. I don't agree with birth control. Why? No, I don't. For these reasons. And I know that I'm right. Because I remember how the world told me in 1960 that birth control was going to solve all the problems of the marriage. We're finally going to be able to regulate birth, have the perfect number of kids, two kids or one kid, whatever you choose, your sex, whatever you want, boy, girl, and you can have all the economic things, you can solve all the problems. And the church said no. Proclaim Christ. And the world turned to the church, condemned the church. The church says, you do. You employ birth control as a way of regulating birth. You will begin to destroy marriage and family on one side because the purpose of sexual relations will be distorted. Adultery will end in. Divorce will come. And then after divorce comes all the dysfunction of drug addiction, alcoholism, the increase of homosexuality because all these male, these, these sexual roles are all disturbed and twisted around and stunt our sexual, psychosexual growth. He said on the other side would be an avalanche of uh, promiscuity because now sex is a play thing, and then we'll have unplanned and unwanted pregnancies, then comes on that STDs, and then, then comes unwanted, uh, unlimited abortion, and then the backside of life will come euthanasia. Pius XII, followed by Pope Paul VI, said those words nearly 45 years ago. They were right. Of course they're right, they preach the truth. They preach the truth of Jesus Christ. Not popular, but it's the truth. Isn't it interesting, all this uproar about people using uh, hormones for average? Oh, we're all mad at Roger Clemens, we're all mad at Barry Bonds. Don't you know how dangerous that is? Brothers and sisters, there's no difference between the anabolic steroid and various terms of chemistry. But no difference between that and a birth control pill. Understand it's the same thing. You're taking something to elevate a certain hormonal level to produce something for you. And guess what? It's just as dangerous. Oh, they didn't tell you that, did they? Read the box. It's dangerous for people to do this. It's not healthy. I tell people, if God called me to marriage, I'd find a woman that would want to practice our natural family planning. I tell her, I love you. I don't want to endanger any part of your life. We already live in a very kind of unhealthy world with the stress and all the chemicals and the additives and food. I wouldn't do that to you. I love you too much. I'm not a dog. I don't respond to just glandular urges. I'm a man and a man of God. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to work at it. And okay, if we get a little frustration, a little tension, We'll go to a walk. We'll do fun things. We'll do something to take the edge off that tension, that sexual tension. And we will, we will give each other that kind of love. Because I, just on the level of health, I don't want to endanger you. There's other reasons. I don't want to endanger your soul. Those are the biggest reasons. But it takes courage for us to be faithful. For us to stand up and proclaim Jesus Truly is the Son of God not an option, not one of the things you can choose in life. It's the only thing in life. His truth is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that gets me through the door of death unto eternal life. Understand it. And then when you get a chance, start here with conversion. When you get a chance, speak up. And maybe you'll be just lucky enough to be a martyr in some kind of way. And you get to be a martyr, guess what? 